So, welcome to the next edition of the Rare Business Podcast. With me today I have Ken Ulisa from Restoration Partners. Hi Ken. Hello, hello. So, for the benefit of our listeners and readers, can you tell us a little bit about you and your background and the work that you do? Yeah, well, let me start with Restoration Partners. We okay. are a boutique technology merchant bank. Mm-hmm. The understanding of that is all in the adjective. So, boutique means small. We have four partners and eight or so staff who support us. Mm-hmm. Technology is information technology, so it's not green, it's not all those sorts of things. Yep. We don't know anything about those, it's, it's IT. A merchant bank is shamelessly modelled on the old Sigmund Warburg banking model okay. of basically creative people, powerful network of contacts and capital all applied to help our clients, and only our clients, grow over the medium term. Okay. So that's, that's what we do. Now my qualifications for being a late stage technology merchant banker where I've spent all of my working life in IT. I started out with an IBM scholarship to university, Cambridge, and then after that I worked for IBM first as a systems engineer, writing programs, putting designing systems in the days when that was something that one person did for a company. Yes. Oh, those are the days <laughs> in languages that no one can now remember, like COBOL and Fortran and RPG. Oh, yes, I remember those. Oh, good. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I, I gave a speech the other day where I used an 80 column punch card to make a point, and nobody in the audience had any idea what I was talking about. Wow. So I'm glad you remember those. It's the but, times of Babbage and all sorts of things. Yeah. <laughs> well, not quite that. No, bad. not quite. <laughs> but well, actually, you're quite right. There wasn't much change between Babbage in my early days. But then I went to Wang Labs where I was at various sales and marketing jobs, and then I was general manager in uh, of the European business, yep. which we turned profitable, and then tried to do a buyout of and failed, and I was fired as a result of that. And I started a business called Interregnum, mm-hmm. which, which morphed into, it wasn't started out as a tech motion bank, but we floated it on the, on the stock exchange and the dot-com boom, which had some great outcomes and some disappointing outcomes, the nature of boom and bust being what it was, and, yes. and six or seven years ago, I started Restoration Partners as a, as a private version, shamelessly, as I said at the beginning, modeled on the Warburg approach to, to merchant banking, which is all about long-term relationships rather than transactions. So I've got nothing against estate agents in the financial services world, no. but most of my competitors are transactionists. They will do a deal, but they've got no interest in a relationship. And the, about the advisory part and the nurturing and all of those sort of things. Exactly. Okay. Now, I read an article in The Guardian recently, and it mentioned your family shield whose motto is do well do good and and then I sort of dug into that a little bit more and, and apparently you have this philosophy that successful businesses should give something back and what I wanted to ask you about was can you tell, tell me a little more about that and why you think that and because we're seeing more and more of that I mean yeah. it's almost it's a bit of a conscious capital type of approach mm. to business or conscious capitalism mm. So, can you tell me a little bit more about that? Well, it's Darwinian, really. So, I, it's, it's actually selfish, as opposed to anything other than that. Seriously, altruistic. I, I argue you can divide the population into three groups of people. Mm-hmm. Those who derive the principal pleasure from disadvantaging other people. Those who derive the principal pleasure on their own without really thinking about anybody else. And those who derive their principal pleasure out of helping other people, getting something from other people. Sure. First group are called sadists. <laughs> yes. The second group are called introspectives, and the third group are called philanthropists. Uh-huh. And Darwinian theory 101, the O level, assumes, sorry, it requires that the ph- philanthropists outnumber the sadists sufficiently well that the future of the human race is assured, mm-hmm. and my children and grandchildren will have a world to live in. Sure. So I'm pleased to be a philanthropist and not a sadist in, the, in that logic, but it, it is kind of enlightened self interest, really. That yes. Society will not continue if there's a predominance of people who get their pleasure at a disadvantage in others. So, the idea of, of doing well, doing good, you don't, it can be separate from business or it can be actually intertwined in business because there's a lot of businesses that are doing really, really well. I mean, I spoke recently to a business called, um, well, the two co-founders of a business called Honest Tea mm-hmm. in the States and they are a startup, it's two guys run, uh, two guys set up a Michael Seth Goldman and uh, his professor or ex-professor, well he's still a professor but he was a professor yeah. in his class, oh, he was a student in his class, guy, well, then Professor Barry Nailbuff from Yale and um, they set up this business, they grew over a course of like 10-12 years from zero to a hundred, just short of a hundred million dollars and mm-hmm. then sold it to Coca-Cola. Mm-hmm. On the proviso that they said this is the way that we do business. It's all done with honesty, with integrity, it's fair trade, it's organic, everything, everything else. 
but they've done really, really well by trying to change, you know, a particular part of the, the market. Mm -hmm. So, I guess my, the short, my short point, my short question <laughs> is, do they need to be intertwined or, or, or can they be separate? I mean, I, because it seems to me that there's a trend, and I'd like your view on it, is that there's a trend towards more conscious ways of doing business. So it's almost like, don't just make your money and then try and make good on it, but actually do good while you're doing well mm. at the same time. Well, I think they're two different, they're two quite different points. So I do quite a lot of mentoring of young people. Okay. Actually, not really mentoring, that's, a, that's an overstatement of the personal nature of it, but I speak to lots of young people at events and so on about uh, well, the lessons that I've learned over my gazillion years on the planet. And, and the most interesting ones are those who just got their A-levels and are going to university or just started university first year yeah. undergraduates because they're still largely blank canvases. They realise that everything they knew is no longer going to be relevant. You know, it's like being a salesman. It's getting set back to zero. They have to start a, a period. Yes. And I, and I say to them all, you can't imagine, as you stand, sit or stand here age 18, what life would be like when you're 58. Mm -hmm. And if I look back 40 years in my life, I, not only could I not have imagined, I find it slightly embarrassing the sorts of things I used to think were hip and cool and leading edge 40 years ago. So there's no point in trying to have huge ambitions for where you think you'll be in 40 years' time because you can't define it. Man can't define that far ahead. But what you can do is set yourself a personal objective to do your absolute best at everything. Mm -hmm. So get to the top. Try to be number one and not number 10. Try and be number 10, not number 100. Get, get to the highest possible point. And really that's what I mean by doing well. It's, it's when you have a choice, always try to do the best thing that happens there. The doing good then is about operating in life, as I was saying earlier, in the philanthropic sector rather than in the sadistic sector. Okay. And, that, and, and that should run across everything. So the answer to your question is a kind of a, it was a long-winded question. Here's a long-winded answer. <laughs> the answer is yes, they are combined, but the first is about achievement. I, I think somebody who's got great A-levels, done really well at university, has a good job, has built a great reputation, has done what you should be doing if they've got that potential. Mm -hmm. But having them achieve that, I think they then have an one has an obligation to then do something for other people and that's the do good bit. Right. What your question was getting at, I think, though, is on the way up to making your fortune, whatever it happens to be, should you do that by stamping on the, uh, the heads of other people, killing them, attacking them, etc. Well, that's the sadist group, but yes. I, don't, I don't like that group. Yes. So my philanthropic definition is a behaviour model. And the great thing about running the sort of business like Restoration Partners is we only work with clients whom we like and who like us. I've built real relationships. Sigmund Warburg said, to create someone, to make someone a client, you must first make them a friend. And, and we believe that fundamentally. So, yeah, we don't get our thrills out of sm smart deals in clause 7.9.2.3.6, something of the contract. That isn't, we think, what you should be doing. So doing well, doing good, I would combine the two. But there's an ethical way of behaving. Yes. Which is, isn't forgotten, because people know when they're not being ethical. Yes. But it, it doesn't today get the credit that it needs to. And I, I, there's been some recent ranting about programmes on television about entrepreneurs, the, the uh, Apprentice in particular. Yes. Putting, persisting business people as all animals, really, climbing on top of each other. Well, it's good TV, but it, and, and it's true in some very small pockets of commerce, but it's not, it's not the mainstream. No. Most of the people I do business with want to do business properly ethically and, and in the interest of longevity. So, so yeah, the answer, that was a long yes, but yes. Okay. I mean, I think there's, a, you talked about a quote from Sigmund uh, Warburg, the, um, there's a, another quote which I think is very, very similar, or in a similar sort of vein, and it's from a, an author by the name of Zig Ziglar, an American chap. Mm -hmm. And uh, he said, if you, help, if you help enough people get what they want, then you'll get what you want. Mm -hmm. And I thought that's quite a nice yeah. way of sort of summing it up in a way. Well, I heard uh, Jack Welsh the other day mm -hmm. talking about the generosity gene. And so there's obviously something happened to us all as we get old. <laughs> Cause, cause I, because it isn't the image that everybody has. But Jack Welsh, Neutron Jack, you know, the, the, yeah. just all the people who leave the building standing, said the best leaders are the ones who get a thrill when their employees get pay rises or promotion. Mm -hmm. I thought actually that does, that absolutely captures the point, which you think is on called the generosity gene, which I'm sure is the title of his next book. But the, but the point, <laughs> Probably. But the point is an excellent point, and I, yes. I, it's back to my third category of philanthropist, as a, which means literally lover of fellow man, as yes. opposed to giving stonking loads of money to other people, as opposed to sadists. So. Yes. I'll look, for, I'll, look, I'll look that up, the generosity gene, and I'll look out Jack's next book. <laughs> but also then, the other thing that you've done recently is you've 
you've actually been doing this. I mean, you actually made a huge donation to uh, Cambridge mm -hmm. to help build a, a sort of a library, and I guess that's the philosophy in action in a way. And it's rather than actually just doing stuff for people individually and, and via relationships, actually, that's that's more about a legacy and infrastructure and, and helping future generations. How did that come about? Was that more of a shower moment? Like I should do this? Um, well, I. It, I gave it to my college, so I, yes. I, and I attribute a great deal of my success in life to what happened to me in my three years at Fitzwilliam in Cambridge. Okay. And it's very hard for those who haven't been to Oxford, actually I can't even speak of Oxford, haven't been to my college, never yes. mind about the generality here, to quite understand the impact that it has. But, but the story I, I told when I became an honorary fellow to the other fellows uh, around the table, which again, an unbelievable thing I could not have imagined 40 years ago, because when I arrived, a naive, a gauche, that's not even naive, a gauche young man from Nottingham, from a poor district in Nottingham, took the train to Cambridge. I was only going to Cambridge because my headmaster, whom I hated, wanted me to try to get into Oxford. So, I, so my, logics were not, my logic for being there wasn't even particularly good. I arrived at this place. It was a lovely, sunny, perfect day. I walked through the three miles from the station to the college, not realising quite how far it was. And when I arrived there, there was a really scary head porter in the porter's lodge. And I go in and I explain how I am, and he looked me up on a list and said, Yes, sir, your, your interview is at 2.30, it'll be in the railway room, follow me, sir. And we walked through the college, and I followed this ramrod straight war veteran, who's now the head porter, to the room where he sat me down, made sure I was comfortable, and went back to the porter's lodge. I remember sitting there thinking, you know what, this is the kind of place a man can be happy in. <laughs> he didn't say, as you would find today, here's the map, go around the corner, do something, or whatever. Mm -hmm. I, was, I went from using the stock exchange today, and the man on the gate said, can I help you? And I said, no, it's fine, I, think I don't need any help. He said, why are you here? I said, I'm here for a meeting. He said, well, what meeting are you here for? I said, well, I'm here for the non-executive director award, kicking the market off this morning meeting. He said, there you are, so you needed help. He said, no, what was his problem? <laughs> <laughs> and the man behind me <coughs> went similarly challenged. Don't get me started on service. <laughs> well, the man behind me went similarly challenged and said, I'm with him. <laughs> Could why fight with a bouncer? And then we both stood in our cup of coffee and said, it's like getting to a bloody nightclub. You know, this is ridiculous. <laughs> we would imagine not having been to nightclubs. So Fitzwilliam, from the moment I arrived at that interview, changed me in, in, I think, not even particularly subtle ways and built that platform. And, I, and it's an open access college, it prides itself on bringing in children from state educated schools, it, it has outreach programs to mm -hmm. go to find the talented people to bring them in. So it ticks all of my personal boxes, social inclusion is a big yeah. uh, agenda item for me. So I love my college, it made a big difference to me, I wanted to make a big difference for generations to come. So that's why Fitzwilliam and, and the library, but there's another interesting twist to that. My mentor, a man called Norman Knight, who's in Boston, who's now in his uh, late 80s, early 90s, has given away a tenth of his income since he started earning money a long, long time ago. And until I met him, he gave it away anonymously. And he and I used to have arguments. He's my mentor, but we used to have arguments yes. about giving it away anonymously. And I said, I think that's a bad idea. And he said, no, I, my ego means I get a huge thrill out of giving money away, and nobody knows it was I who gave the money. Sure. And I said, yeah, but unfortunately, it fails on the role model stage. Mm -hmm. That means that nobody knows you gave it, so nobody knows the humble background you came from, what you've achieved, and now what you're doing. So all the other people who've come from humble backgrounds don't see you as a role model. And I'm very pleased to say that the Norman Knight Hyperbaric Centre in Mass General Hospital, the Norman Knight Nursing Centre, etc., etc., are all now bear his name, and he's an enormous role model now for people in the Boston area. So the Alyssa Library at Fitzwilliam gives me a thrill every time I see it, which is every time I can possibly go up there. Mm -hmm. But it means I bump into people in the street who have graduated from the college who thank me for my wife and my generosity, which allowed them to get a better class degree than they would otherwise have got. So it, it completes the circle. They help me, I help them. Sure. It helps people like me going forward, puts me firmly in the philanthropic and not in the sadistic category. Sure. sure. And also, it sort of takes the role model sort of box as well, because it comes yeah. back to that, that you talk about uh, social inclusion, and e I know you're a fervent supporter of equal opportunities, and also equal opportunities, and uncovering and supporting entrepreneurs from all areas of society, because mm. it's all that, I guess like you say, it's, it's, it's like, it's, it's talent spotting, mm. in a way, it's like what Fitzwilliam uh, mm. did, uh, or does in its outreach uh, programs, but I guess, some of the work that you're doing as well is also about uh, spotting and nurturing sort of talent mm. and entrepreneurial talents. 
that, I mean, that, that's right. Well, yes, I, I, if I was asked what I'm interested in now, so if I define philanthropy in the more normal sense mm -hmm. of, of giving as opposed to loving your fellow too, rather than loving your fellow man, if I define philanthropy that way, I define my, interest, my philanthropic interest as social inclusion. Right. So, so if opportunities I do care about, but it's more than that, because there are people who can't avail themselves of the opportunity for a, ver for a variety of reasons. And equalising it's insufficient. You have to do more to help those people get across the line. And the, and the thing that one has to do is to help them to raise their self-esteem. Right. So, so my passion is social inclusion and my solution is systems, processes, organisations that are targeted at raising the self-esteem of individuals. I've been, I've been chairman of a homeless charity for many years. Okay. And, uh, and many years ago when I started out as chairman there, we thought that ending street homelessness involved getting people off the streets basically by coercion, by physical means, whatever, and into somewhere which had by definition been better than living on the streets. And we were always surprised when people then went back to live on the streets, even though they got a council flat. Mm -hmm. And the reason was they had no community in the council flat and they had a community on the streets. Yes. And why does a community matter? Because that's where one gets some of one's self-esteem from. And over the years at Thames Reach, we've shifted the needle from let's worry about the service to let's worry about the person. Mm -hmm. and when you worry about the person, you spend your time doing the things to help that person rebuild their self-esteem, reconnect with their family, get employment, solve their literacy problems, whatever it happens to be, the things that we all take for granted, they also want to take for granted. And once they've done that, once they've rebuilt their self-esteem, they then have the opportunity to access opportunity. Sure. And, and so that's so key. And social inclusion is about therefore doing that lifting job so that the individual can then go off and take advantage of it. Do you think in the UK that we're doing enough in, the, in those sort of areas to, to involve as many people, not necessarily and avail, help them to avail them of opportunities and particularly in the, um, if I think about the economic situation in the UK right now, we're coming, supposedly coming out of a recession and we're looking towards sort of enterprise to try and drive us sort of forward and that by definition is, is also going to be about identifying future entrepreneurial sort of talent. I mean, are we doing enough? For, uh, to identify sort of and support future talents, do you think? Well, the, I'm sure the answer is no, because I guess one can't ever do enough. But are we doing significantly more now, or is the environment significantly better now than it was 30 or 40 years ago? The answer is a resounding yes. And I, and I say that, well, first of all, when I worked in IBM in the 70s, the two people who left IBM to start their own business were considered to be evident spirits. Right. Because, because nobody but a spirit would go and leave a huge company like IBM and go and start their own business what were they, corner shop tradesmen or something, yes. who was so arrogant. Because that was the era when you joined British Gas or somebody and you worked there for 35 years, had mm -hmm. a gold watch and left, and that was the defined uh, career. And you might change jobs once in your lifetime. And you certainly wouldn't graduate from a great university and start your own business. Mm -hmm. Today, people graduate from great universities and are reluctant to join large organisations because they'd like to have a go at starting their own business. So, that, so the, the talent has changed fundamentally. And one of the big drivers of that has been a change in the, in the insolvency law in the UK. Mm -hmm. I used to envy America and Chapter 11 because it seemed a group of managers who crashed a business could take, go onto the court, get the business back, leaving all their debts behind them and have another go at crashing it. It, it, was, it was the most amazing phenomenon. And their focus was... And it still exists. At t totally. And their focus was on them. It wasn't really on anything else. Certainly not the creditors, and definitely not the shareholders, not the staff because they laid half of them off, but on themselves. But it was still better than here, where anything that had gone bust, you had the stigma, which meant you could never do anything again. Our insolvency laws have changed in the last decade to the point that much of that stigma, possibly all of that stigma, has now gone. I've got friends who've been in responsible for business that have gone bust, and they carry on. I mean, they, they, it's horrible at the time, but they recover and get on. I've been director of business that have gone bust over the last 10 years. I can't remember the name of the first one. Now. Yeah. The whole world has changed fundamentally. And with that change, the stigma of becoming a basically a spiv, has gone away because it's just something you try to do. And is it more than that? Is it not at the, the end? Are we eroding this, the stigma that, that surrounds sort of trying and failing in a way, but also about trying and succeeding as well? 
Yeah, or is there still something heavy that sits around that as well? We've always been a schizophrenic on success. <laughs> you know, Cheeky Chappy, Richard Branson has always been Cheeky Chappy, he's always popular. So we don't really resent Richard Branson, despite all the checkered past that he's had. Sure. Because he's, he's in the acceptable entrepreneurial camp. Mm -hmm. But Luke Johnson and Hugh Osmond and those sorts So over the years, we've accumulated more and more and more completely acceptable people, much closer to the American model, yes. of, of celebrities who've made money from their businesses. So, so I, I think that's, that has been changing anyway. Yes. When, when I was a boy, celebrities were a small number of sports people, an amazingly large number of politicians, and the occasional business person. That's shifted fundamentally. Now, sports people are still there, but business people, Richard Branson, Lord Sugar, etc., it, <coughs> it's all part of the panel. So, yes, so, so you've got role models, which makes it an acceptable social thing to do. Mm -hmm. If you aren't any good at football or rap music, then business isn't a bad thing to go into. <laughs> you want to escape wherever you are. And, and there, is, there isn't a stigma of having money, there isn't a stigma of wealth, at least in London. I, I perhaps can't overgeneralise sure. safely here, but, but the London bubble, you know, we, we, we're, there's a buzz of getting on with something. So I think we're better than America now. Right. The, American, the American dream is a complicated one, as, as exemplified by Obamacare. There's a, there is a mean gene inside America yes. that says, we don't, if, if you're weak, then that means you are somehow inferior. And if you're inferior, I will climb on top of you. That's the sagest group view as opposed to the philanthropic one. And I'm astonished at the backlash in America against Obamacare. There's some reasons not to like Obama, there's some reasons not to like the law. So those are both legitimate, but that isn't the thrust of the argument. Yeah. The thrust of the argument is philosophically, if you're weak, then you're a loser. And therefore you have to, you have to take the consequences. Sort of Darwinian evolution on steroids. In a, in, in, well, in a, yeah, that's right. It's accelerating Darwinian, really. <laughs> it's going like, no. How can we accelerate your shuffling off yes. this mortal coil? And he ignores one fact, which is one day the weak may rise up and tear yeah. down the people who have got unfair distribution of the, of the wealth. In well, indeed. Darwinian 101. <laughs> <laughs> well, exactly. So, you've done, I mean, you've had a tremendously varied sort of career and it's not been linear sort of going like this has been up and down and and and, and as all entrepreneurial Could I just put out those gestures don't really work on a podcast no no I know I mean I'm just sort of <laughs> this is me sort of speaking <laughs> but thank you for that Ken <laughs> I know that for the, the for the benefit of listeners I have now have a red face <laughs> uh, but um your career hasn't been so linear, there's been, you know, some, as you've said earlier on, there's been some ups and downs. I mean, if I was to ask you what, if you were to share any big lessons that you've learned or some advice or tips for aspiring sort of entrepreneurs or current entrepreneurs, what would, what would you say to, you know, to them? I think the most useful tip I'd give to an entrepreneur is to describe something which is going to be hard to do on radio and I wish I hadn't now chastised you for the gesture <laughs> called the entrepreneurial cycle which I would have to ask those listening at home on the radio <laughs> to imagine but the entrepreneurial cycle is a journey in a circle starting with having an idea mm -hmm. once you've had an idea you then do some research on that idea mm -hmm. having done the research on the idea you then develop a plan having developed a plan you then resource the plan hire the people raise the money whatever it happens to be and then you implement the plan mm -hmm. and that lets you realize that the idea wasn't as good as you thought it was and so you refine the idea do a bit more research and you go around the cycle again and entrepreneurs do that at speed yes Executives don't do that. They, there's another cycle for being an executive, but it's, a, it's, a, it's not relevant at this point. Mm -hmm. it's, a, it's just a different cycle. That means that for entrepreneurs, they find everybody else irritating. Their domestic partner who says, why are you still working 12 hours a day when you said this will be over in six months, 12 months, whatever it happens to be? And the answer is because I've moved around the cycle several times and the idea I'm now working on is a refinement of the original idea and it still requires 12 hours worth of effort. Their investors, don't like them because they say, but I put my money in based on a story you told me a year ago and you're no longer telling that story. Therefore, you are dangerous and possibly a liar. And staff don't like it because when they came in on Monday, they thought they got one task and by Friday, the task has changed and no one's explained why. And the problem for the entrepreneur is all of that's annoying mm -hmm. and, it's, and, and it's, it's as if you're trying to cycle with the brakes on. Yes. And so you get rid of possibly not your domestic partner, but often they do. You get rid of your investors, you fall out with them, you get rid of your staff and replace them, and they hope you'll eventually find somebody who understands you. Actually, the way to solve that problem is to set your eyes on a goal, not just on the idea. Right. And, and I always say that goal should be defined in terms of money and time. 
So I think I can turn this into a business that will be worth £10 million in three to five years' time, and I will own half of it, which means I'll have £5 million that I can then tell my domestic partner, this is why I've been doing it. Right. I can tell my staff, I'm changing my idea because I need us to get closer to hitting that three to five year time window. <coughs> and the way we were doing it before wasn't going to get us there. And investors, all you care about is you put a million in and you want three out. Yes. So as long as I get to 10, you'll be okay. Mm-hmm. Not defining a destination is the biggest killer of being an entrepreneur. Right. I guess that also kind of allows everybody to be able to break it down and measure progress against it yes. at the same time. And so you can then chunk things down rather than it, everything feeling like you're chasing an idea or something. It always <coughs> feels like it's never perfect or it's always slightly out of reach. Yes, you don't know where you're going. Yes. So what you're doing is you're fixing something at the moment and you, the entrepreneur, knows where you're going, but you're going somewhere which is an extrapolation of where you come from. Sure. Nobody else knows where you, you haven't told everybody else, so you don't know where you're going. But if, let's take the metaphor of a journey. If you say, what I'd like to do is I'd like us all to go to Birmingham for lunch and it's quarter to 12. So there's no point in starting on this journey because we can't get to Birmingham for any definition of lunchtime. So there's a discussion now about let's not even start out on this journey because it doesn't make any sense. Sure. But if we haven't said that, that where we're trying to get to, we all go downstairs, go to King's Cross or wherever you go, Houston, and, and off you go and realise it's four o'clock before you've got to Birmingham. Oh, yes. Man, I've got to tell you. So having a destination defined crystallises everybody's views and allows everybody else to participate in the debate. So my biggest message to an entrepreneur is do not feel under any pressure because you changed your idea. That is what entrepreneurs do. Mm-hmm. Don't feel under, feel under any pressure because people are attacking you, because that's what they do to entrepreneurs and telling you why your idea is a bad idea. But you do feel under pressure to share the destination with everybody, and that's how you can crystallise everyone's focus on that common objective. Another question, if I was to say to you, if you had the opportunity to, the opportunity to replay your, your career, would you do anything differently? Yes, yes. I've made one, I've made two enormous strategic mistakes in, in my life. One was to fail to take my own advice, which I'm very fond of giving to other people. <laughs> and, and the other one was to fail to do the management buyout of the Wang European business. Okay. The Wang European business, I was running, my boss in America didn't like me, didn't like the business, asserted that we were losing money and draining cash. We proved we were making money and generating cash. He refuted that. Perfect setup for management buyout. I made a, a, a tentative offer, I went to the city, got some money, made a tentative offer and was fired. And many years later I met one of the board members who had been on the board of Wang at the time and I asked him why they hadn't taken my offer more seriously and he said, what offer? At which point I realised I'd failed to escalate mm. until the ultimate point, what I was trying to do. Sure. So my big message to everybody based on that lesson is, if you've got commitment, then you don't give up until the end. Whereas I did, I was very British about it and I gave up because I was rebutted by my boss. Stupid, and I lost out on what was a big prize. Mm-hmm. The other big mistake I made was that we invested a lot of money at Interregnum in a portfolio of high value, high potential assets, we thought, confident that we would raise another fund and then invest the second fund in the first thing we'd invested. We failed to raise a second fund. We were failing before September 11th happened, September 11th wiped out all prospects of us of ever succeeding. And then we had all of our cash invested in illiquid and minority positions in high potential businesses that we could have no influence over. A piece of advice I always give to other people is learn the lesson that you rang your time and never let go of tree A until you're sure that tree B is secure. <laughs> and I stupidly let go of tree A by investing all the money and I hadn't secured tree B. So my two big lessons to everybody based on my biggest ever blunder strategically but always escalate yes. until you're either defeated or have victory. And secondly, never let go of tree A until you're sure that tree B is secure. Brilliant. I love it. <laughs> so, okay, that's, 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 been, I mean, that's been brilliant. I mean, there's a couple of things that I, a couple of questions I always finish these um, interviews on is, and the first one is, I mean, what's your um, restoration partner's plans for sort of 2013, the rest of 2013 and, and, and beyond. I mean, is it still stay really boutique and really focused or are you going to grow in terms of offices and things? What's, what, what's, what's your sense of kind of where you're going? Where's your plan? What's your target? I guess? Our, our, our strategy is defined by three principal objectives, which are called push, pull and combine. Push is to help high potential technology companies grow up the, up the slope. 
mm -hmm. and turn into wealth and we get paid in a, in a mixture of fees and equity mm -hmm. so we get to share our rewards with our clients. Pool is where we work with large companies to access that pool of intellectual property that they need for their innovative purposes. Mm -hmm. And combine is where we act as a principal to buy flatlining businesses and innovators and to combine the two. And we are very strong in the push business. Mm -hmm. We have a huge project underway with a big defence contractor on the pool business. And we've got our sights set on our negotiations to do our first combined deal where we will own the assets and our investors would invest through us in those companies. Okay. So, that, so for us, the quantum leap will come when the push part of our business becomes less as a percentage, although hopefully greater in volume, and the pull and the combine start to become equal legs. I said I shamelessly modeled on Sigmund Warburg. He started out by helping traders do better. Yep. Then he started to work with much larger organizations that want to do things. And then it's a little known fact that there was a time when Warburg owned a brick factory because it was an asset that he could see value in that nobody else could, so they bought it themselves and, and realised the, the profit. So, so our quantum leap will come when we go from being principally a push-based business to being a pull and combine. Fantastic. Um, and the final question that I always, always end these interviews on, and that is, is there anything that you would like to shamelessly plug? <laughs> would you repeat that last word? <laughs> shamelessly plug. Oh, plug, that's a relief. <laughs> I'm, I, I, you asked me a question earlier on about uh, the, the environment in the UK for entrepreneurs. Mm -hmm. and there are still some things that need to be sorted in our capital structure that would make, I think, a fundamental difference. So, I, so I'm on a capital rant at the moment, so I will shamelessly plug the two of them. Mm -hmm. One is to do with bank lending. It's deeply frustrating to me that entrepreneurs cannot borrow money from the banks mainly because it's my money which has been pumped, which has been pumped into the banks and is not available then to my clients. And that, that I find deeply irritating. So we've invented some... And, and the reason is that the banks require security. Mm -hmm. And in my world, the technology world, there is never any security. No. I, there's, there's IP which isn't worth anything in the view of the banks. There's, there are PCs and desks and so on which aren't worth enough to subsidise anything and often don't belong to the company. Sure. And that's it. So they want your house. And unfortunately, securing bank debt on your house is stupid. The 2008 collapse reminds us just how stupid it is systemically, but it's stupid for an entrepreneur. I talked earlier about the entrepreneurial cycle and the need to try to persuade others of what you're doing. If you are dragging along some Sisyphusian uh, load from a rock, which is the fact that you have to day, one day go and say to your partner, not only have I not been at home for a year, and I've been doing 12 hour days and all the rest of it, but I've blown the house. <laughs> it's, a, it's, it's such an antidote to entrepreneurialism. So if, we, if we're serious in the UK about promoting entrepreneurialism, we have to liberate bank debt. I don't think that bank lending is a security issue. 2008, the students of history can take a look at. I think it's an insurance issue. Sure. And so we, we're promoting something called the uh, Guaranteed Repayment Insurance Premium. The idea that you pay 15% of any loan from the bank for an insurance premium, okay. which then guarantees repayment of the loan. Now, interesting, the latest uh, buy to let, uh, buy, home buy scheme yeah. does the same thing for home mortgages. So, actually, it's not even as innovative as we thought it was <laughs> when, we, when we came up with it. It's meeting a lot of resistance, but I have had a meeting with Vince Cable, and I'm, we're continuing this, and we're talking to an insurance company about creating it. The reason Vince Cable is important is the government, the Treasury, underwrites 15% yeah. of bank loans mm -hmm. that go into, into businesses, although you don't get any benefit of that as a business. Yeah. We'd like that 15% into our scheme. So, get a grip is one of the things that I'm plugging. And the other one is, through, I've lived through the wars of Eurasian Natural Resources Corporation, ENRC, mm -hmm. where I was unceremoniously fired. I think I'm the first uh, ever director of a, of a FTSE 100 company to be fired at an AGM. And Sir Richard Sachs is the second. We were fired simultaneously. And the only reason I'm the first is that O comes before S. But, but he, and, <laughs> he, and, he and I were fired. And one of the most frustrating things about the whole ENRC experience was the behaviour of the London tracker funds who invest in everything in the FTSE 100 by getting a list of the FTSE 100, weighting it by the size of the FTSE 100 companies and then allocating their funds against it. An Excel spreadsheet job and then charging half to one and a half percent yes. of the money for doing that. And they attacked us and said we had poor government standards and we were a disgrace to the index, etc., etc. And when I said, well, you shouldn't have invested in this if you knew we were a poor government story, which they knew, they said, no, we're forced to invest in you. 
And I find that so terrible. They have the cheek to charge a percentage of my money for investing in something that they don't want to invest in in the first place. Where is the value added? That's the wrong end of the good bits about the city. So I'm also advocating something called the Good Governance 100, the GG100. Mm -hmm. And I've gathered a group of the willing, and we're having our first heads-up meeting later this year. I'm hoping it's going to be sponsored by the Institute of Directors as, a, as an, an independent brand. And the idea is that we create a GG100, which will be, over time, will become an investable index, which means that no tracker fund will have the defence that they were compelled to invest in one index rather than the other, and Good Governance will get another kick up, uh, up the spectrum which it, which it needs. So get a grip and the GG100 would be my two shameless plugs. That's fantastic. Well, what I'll do when I, uh, when I edit this up and, and uh, write it all up, I'll get all that linked up and things. So when it goes out, we'll give those two things, as well as all the other lessons that you shared, um, a big shout out. So, but Ken, thank you for your time and your insight. It's been a pleasure. You're very welcome. Good to see you. All the best. <laughs>